Welcome everyone to tonight's show uh, episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a very special guest. Her name is Lisa O'Hare. She has uh, a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from San Jose State University in California, where she lived until 2011. She worked for many years in law firms, starting as a floater legal secretary and ending up in, in IT and went on to work for engineering companies in Silicon Valley and also in uh, a Department of Defense company that had its ties to SRI. Uh, she is now enjoying retirement. She re Since retiring, she discovered she was a psychic medium and that knowledge was the catalyst for many discoveries about herself, one of which was that she is an abduct ET abductee. After reading Terry Lovelace's book, Incident at Devil's Den, she wrote to Terry and he encouraged her to write her own book detailing her ET experiences as an abductee. She now lives in Chandler, Arizona with her husband and two Maine Coon cats. Welcome to tonight's show, Lisa O'Hare. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. How are you this evening? I'm pretty good. How about yourself? I'm very good. So, um, what was I said about you? Oh, you were a legal secretary. My mother was a legal secretary for her whole career. Uh, my wife was a legal secretary before she became a private investigator. So anyway, let's go ahead and jump right into your story. All righty. So let me put myself in the screen here. That's one thing I haven't done. All right, so. Uh, uh, so. Uh, first question I usually ask most of my guests is, uh, what was the very first odd event in your life? Oh, let me go turn down my uh, lighting a little bit. Okay. And I'll let you answer the question. So, what was the very first, the very first odd experience in your life? The very, very first one, which I, is not in my book, is that I kept having horrible nightmares when I was about four, five or six, that um, I was in a dark place and huge uh, slashes like of crayon marks were chasing me and I was running from them and screaming. Uh, can you back up and say that again? What was chasing you? Um, sort of like... I don't know, lo very large, crayon, different colored crayon uh, slashes like you would make on a paper. Um, so, so you were being chased by slashes on a paper? Yes. <laughs> this was a dream you had. Yeah, that was a dream I had. So, um, so how, did, how did you connect uh, that dream to anything that is anything beyond just a dream? Um, because I kept having it, it was recurring. Um, I had it fairly regularly, like every night, um, you know, waking up screaming. So um, that was my very first odd experience. How long, how many times do you think you had it? How long okay. did it last? And then how did that, uh, did it, did anything uh, regarding that flow beyond that? Did it, did it continue in some fashion? Um, you know, it was just one of those things where, you know, when you have strange things, especially, you know, I'm, you know, pretty old and uh, my mom never talked about anything of, of, of unusual fashion. You know, she never, if you said I had a bad dream, oh, it was just a bad dream, you know, she would just dismiss it. But um, basically it just happened like about 10 times, like 10 times in a row. Um, or it would happen every month, you know, uh, for about six months. You know, it would happen really regularly. And so I just considered that to be just one of those weird things that I could never explain. Um, so beyond that, um, I, uh, I didn't understand what it meant. I do think it has to do with abduction. I've uh, done, a, uh, done regression on it, and it's about being taken from my bedroom when I was a little girl. So you believe it's a screen memory? Yes, I do. And um, so who, who if you're okay with telling me us, 
who regressed you and how many regressions did, how, all before you answered uh, how many regressions did you have and what else did you learn uh, beyond this uh, the slash dream um Yvonne Smith who is a I guess she's MUFON and she runs a group called Ciro C-E-R-O um is a experiencer group she regressed me um i've done multiple regressions with her uh, over different weird dreams that i've had um and also i've done my own uh, using the tools that i made and uh, created in my book um uh, from stuart swordlow but um so what i found was that um i would be taken at night there would be a white bright white light in my room uh, something would come i'd be hiding under the bed they would come in and take me and then I would end up on a ship or some sort of really bright white room. I'd be there with other women, other people, just mostly women in my in that section. I would have some sort of gynecological exam or I don't know, something that had to do with between my legs. Um, then I would also the people there were wearing shoes. You know, they looked like people, except they had giant blue eyes, like extra large blue eyes, but with a um, like a the pupil that was pointy, like a, a reptilian pupil. <laughs> so uh, that's what I would see. That's what I saw. So um, it was strange being regressed because uh, it's a really weird experience. You're not asleep. You know, nobody knows what to expect during one of those things. And so I found that to be one of them. Um, then uh, the same thing with, I had this dream fairly recently, or I guess a year or so ago, that I was in uh, in a giant room, like a big um, aircraft room, warehouse. And there were all these refrigerators everywhere and there were babies in there. And I had, there was an overseer on a separate level watching me, making sure I was taking care of the babies. And, you know, it's just creepy stuff like that. So uh, can you describe the, the beings that uh, – did you just describe more than one being? Uh, yeah, I did. Sorry. Okay, go back to the first set of being. The first beings, beings uh, look kind of like people. I mean, they look like doctors, and they're wearing, you know, wingtip shoes and that kind of thing. Um, it was in a bright room, and they look like regular people, except they had very large blue eyes, but they had a reptilian pupil, you know, so their pupil wasn't round. It was pointed. So they were, you think they were uh, shape-shifted reptilians? Yes, I do. Okay, and... Um, all right, so that was, and you, um, how do I put this, you you were taken, how many times do you think those, that particular race, the first one, took you? I don't know. I actually don't know. If you had to guess. Uh, do you mean when I was a little girl or in general? No, I'm talking. About, let's concentrate on the first set of alien experiences you had. Uh, that way we can parse them out into separate things. Okay. Well, uh, I think that that probably happened probably every night. I mean, I don't know. I would say. I mean, it happened pretty regularly. But you have an idea how long it lasted from start to finish. Um. You mean the actual incident? No, no. The the from how do you were the very first event that occurred, the very first abduction, to right. the last abduction by that group that you remember. Um, you know, I really don't think it's ever ended. But um, okay, well that's fine. That, that, if that's your answer, that's good. Is, yeah. Any answer you give is fine. It's just a matter. <laughs> How you keep it straight in your head. Well, in my, uh, you know, when I did my regressions, I found out that that actually happened when I was three. So um, because when Yvonne uh, regressed me, she had me walking around in my house and, and describing it. And I couldn't see, you know, I they said, I said, my mom looks like my mom is cooking, but I couldn't see because when you're three, you're not very tall, right? 
So when I was wandering around in my mom's kitchen, I couldn't see what she was doing. It looked like she was near the stove. So to me, that says, you know, I'm approximately three years old. And um, and maybe she took me there. Maybe I'm not remembering it correctly, but basically, um, but I, I was in my room and uh, I had to go to bed early, um, you know, because I was a little girl. And uh, then my white, my whole room filled up with white light and it was windy and I was taken somewhere. So. So how many? How many uh... Okay, so how many, uh, it, during the uh, 10 or so times that Yvonne regressed you, right. and you, you went over the events with that particular race of beings. Right. Uh, how, how, um, how much detail, how much length of time within the construct of actually being in their presence. If you had to string all of that information that you got, with how many times you were with Yvonne, all together into a single time, how how much time do you think you recovered on board with Yvonne, with those with those particular beings? Um, I don't know. This is a strange question. <laughs> Um, I don't know, because, you know, we would go through, you know, dreams that I've had or situations that I needed to try to figure out what was happening with me. And then we would go to these situations and she would just take me backwards until that time. So I would say probably, I don't know, maybe a year. I don't know. Well, the reason why I ask is because I was once interviewed by uh, one gentleman who himself is an abductee and extremely knowledgeable gentleman who owns his own radio station and uh, physical radio station. And he said that he made the statement that um, abductees, even after being regressed, usually don't recover that much information. It, you know, the, the total amount of information that you're able to recover even with the regression is infinitesimally small compared to the actual amount of time you've been abducted. You know, you're only getting the tiniest fraction of it. So that's where I was coming from. I'm trying to understand whether you feel like, okay, so a better way to ask that question is just take us through any of those onboard experiences with that race that the details as much as you can as if in other words take the audience through <laughs> one of those the like maybe the first one that had any length to it and then after that one just keep going through them uh so that we have as much on board uh experience it, we're trying to basically suck out your out of your brain the the good parts as far as what those experiences are you know we we, we we don't know about the onboard stuff that much, so that's what people want to hear about, what happened on board. So okay. if you go through the first one of those and then you just keep going through them after that and give as much deal, detail as you can. Well, um, so, well, it's, this is in my book, but one this wasn't regression by um, Yvonne, but, um, you know, I have been taken on several ships. One of them was a ship with a person that just looked like like a bright white light person, like as if they had that being was, you know, didn't have any skin, was just like a light, a light being, I guess, so to speak. And they were scanning me for something and they pulled something out of my arm. So when I was there, it seemed like there was, you know, a big bank of windows and that's where the controls were. Um, there was also, everything was really bright and really shiny. Um, or oh, 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 I don't, don't keep that in your mind, what you're saying. I, I, I don't want to hurt. I don't want to stop you. I'm just getting in the middle of it. Uh, and you can resume here in just a second. So. Uh, who are the beings this time? I don't know who they were. When I say who, I mean, give us 
your what you saw of them you know what did they look like that sort of thing it just looked like bright white light oh that's right you just went over that okay so did let's go back okay bright white light yeah uh there is about many different ways a bright white light can ex exist in my in one of my dreams i had a bright white light which was one of my dogs uh coming back to me after it was deceased it was huge and had very little detail when you say bright white light do you mean a uh, a human looking form that was lit up was partially see-through you know i'm putting words yeah. in your head what i mean <laughs> bright white light what can you be yeah. a little more detailed a bright about that? white light that was see-through that was so it was kind of bluish and um it was just a human shape and they they didn't they didn't have any facial features or anything and they were scanning me and they pulled something out of my right arm that they found so that's just one of my experiences and you and you've I assume you picked that one up through Yvonne's help. No, no, not that one. How did you How did you recover that memory? I recovered that memory um, from using uh, some tools in my book. Um, oh, the Swerd, uh, Stuart Swerdlow's technique. Yeah, students Swer Stuart Swerdlow's techniques from the, the, the staircase, the staircase, the green. Yeah, staircase. the green spiral staircase. That's I had that book, so I know what you're doing. Oh, you did? Okay, I, okay. I had the book. I had it. Have you used it? No, I, I've, I've never used it, but I have. I bought that a while back, long before I heard of you. Okay. So I do have the book, and I have read it, and I am familiar with the technique. I have never been successfully regressed in my life, even though I, I'm a hypnotist myself, hypnotherapist, and uh, retired sort of, and uh, one of my talents. And but I bartered my. Uh, um, talent as a hypnotherapist with many other hypnotherapists, but not one has ever successfully regressed me. Oh, wow. I've been hypnotized, self-hypnotized, and hypnotized by many others, but I've never regressed or been regressed. So that's another story. But uh, go on with your onboard story with the beings of light, please. All right. So the beings of light, I don't know how I got into their ship. I just, you know, and that's one of my issues is I don't really see a lot of times when I'm going into a ship. Um, I am aware of what's happens to me before, and then it's a blank out, and then I wake up and I'm in a ship. So, um, so I don't know how I got there. If I got sucked up, I don't know any of that. So, are you um, on a table? Yeah, and and with the beings that with the light beings, no. Um, so no for this one, but other ones, yes, I'm on a table. I'm on a, I'm on a table. It's like a shiny aluminum table. It's cold, um, being, you know, grays or whoever will pull over some sort of machinery, suck out my eggs. They'll, uh, try to put stuff on my head. So you've been used as a breeder. Yes. Okay. Go back to your story with the beings of light. Okay. With well, the beings. Before we confuse before my interruptions confuse everything that you're saying. <laughs> All right. So the beings of light seem to be um, to be a nice group. Uh, they were looking for something, um, but I don't know if they really are nice because they brought me into a ship. They pulled something out of my arm, and um, you know that's pretty much it. It's like a snippet. You know, it's not. There isn't much information like you. So were do you think that that what they pulled out of your arm was a alien implant from another race? Yes, I do. Okay. All right. So, uh, is that the only uh, onboard event that you remember with that particular race? Yes. Okay. Go to the next event, um, onboard event, or non board onboard event with, or next event with aliens in any fashion. All right. Well, um, I usually, a lot of my dreams have to do with spiders or not spiders, a lot of my in situations have to do with spiders. Spiders, because of reptilians, use spiders as their pets. I think they also have different spider races uh, working with them. So um, uh, I'll 
be in a situation and I'll have spider um, activities going on. Uh, spiders will come and pick me up at night um, and I will end up talking to spiders about, you know, things that happened to me. Um, and I've seen a lot of spider cats, like there's experimentation going on. So you've been abducted by spiders? Yes. So how many races have you been abducted? Uh, uh, different types of beings. I won't even call them races because I'm not, I guess you would call spiders a race, but how many different types of beings have you been abducted by? Just vaguely the number. It seems like about four or five because first there's humans, right? So the humans do also abduct me. Um, and I've been on, I think, feel like I've been on a lot of underground military bases. Then um, I have, um, you know, the praying so mantis. Been, so you've been through my labs? Yes. And then there's the praying mantis, um, and then the spiders, and then the reptilians. So four or five. So I don't know if we should parse this out by, uh, by linearity, as in by time or by types of aliens. Uh, it, however you think you can keep track of all this in your head through this conversation, uh, do go on with your story. Either go to the next event linear, linearly in time, or you can parse it out by types of beings. Whatever, however you can keep it straight, just go to the next event that you want to talk, that you're open to all talk right. Let's talk about this. Um, so um, I think it was 2017. Uh, an implant in my legs started throbbing. And the next thing I know, there's a large praying mantis standing next to my bed and wants to take me to me to go on a ship. Oh, I think I remember you talking about that uh, either in another interview or some in some. Oh, maybe it might have been in your book when I read yeah, your book. It's in my book. <laughs> yeah, I think I read it in your book. Yes. Uh, so do you have a copy of your book with you now? Yes. Hold it up. Thank you. Uh, abducted and furious. Okay, so we'll make sure that even if we forgot, you at least get to show it. <laughs> plug <you know>. it. <laughs> yeah, plug it at least once. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we could get and spend a lot of time here and actually forget to yeah. plug the book at some point. So, uh, all right, you. You didn't allow the rep to, the uh, mantid to take you on board, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And uh, if they, you realize that if they ask you, that means they're being nice, right? Yeah. The, the not so nice ones don't ask. Yes. Well, I think that actually my initially, and don't forget that that was quite a few years ago. Initially, I thought that, uh, yeah, they were just being friendly and I felt I could feel their emotions, but uh, now I know differently. But uh, at the time, I felt like she, the mantis at that time was a female. They really wanted me to come on the ship. They were asking me if I would want to I'd go on the ship to fix my leg and I kept saying no. So then they said, well, if the bad guys take you, will you allow it? And I said, yes, only if the bad guys, not realizing that they were the bad guys and also that uh, it was a manipulation. Okay, so um, is that one event where you had the alien implant in your leg was hurting you, the mantis came along, wanted to take you on board. Uh, was that the first encounter with the mantis you had? That I know of, but no, uh, probably not. But that's one of them that I re recognized that I uh, wanted to know who was taking me and um, I got to see, but it wasn't who I thought. It wasn't Grays, which I had heard of. But I never in a million years expected to see mantis, praying mantis, at my bed that were about seven feet tall. Yeah, I was just about to ask you to describe. So seven foot tall. Yeah. Uh, it's like an upside down triangular-ish head. Yeah. Huge eyes. And so, so sometimes when people describe their height, they, they say, well, it was bending over <laughs> just to be seven foot tall. If it stood up straight, it'd be much taller. So yeah. was it bending over or standing up straight? It was standing up straight, and I'm 5'10", so 
I usually can gauge a little pretty good about how tall people are. Can you so, be more specific on any description of the mantis as, uh, in, as in uh, color or anything else? Green uh, and I think with a little bit of cream. And uh, I was just so shocked. I was so, uh, I couldn't even move. I just was so fascinated by what I could see stand, standing next to my bed. So what did, did the arms look? I've heard different things about the arms. How did they look? Did they look like Frank Mantis arms. <laughs> I mean, was it, you know, with the come up and then droop down sort of thing, some odd, you know, no. real, real pairing Mantis is not uh, going to look like the alien. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, you know, I actually don't really remember. I mean, I, I was fascinated with it. I did stare at her for quite a while. I just couldn't believe my eyes. And, um, you know, the fact that she was telepathically talking to me also was really strange. Also, I felt a little bit like, um, not hypnotized, but yeah, I felt a little hypnotized. Like I was not moving. I wasn't acting like my normal self, you know, maybe it was a little bit of mind control going on where, you know, first she was, you know, love bombing me with all of her emotions to make me compliant. And then also I just felt kind of not paralyzed, like I couldn't move in a bad way, but I was just fascinated. So how did you come to understand that or come to believe, whether it's true or not, that she was or that being was not a good being or didn't have didn't. Let, let, let me put it this way. How, how did you come to understand that uh, that being did not have your best interests at the top of her list? Um, it took a little while because I like to be the, you know, give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Um, and also because I had a second uh, encounter with a male praying mantis that hit me on my private parts and also pointed at me to make me fall asleep. Um, and so because of that, and also from my experiences after the book, I've realized that they have their own agenda and uh, they don't care what I want in my life. They have an, an agenda and it's all about um, them, which kind of reminded me of being narcissistic. So um, since the narcissist uh, is very self-serving they have their own agenda everything they do they do with a purpose that has to do with them um, over time i just realized plus i read my book right before i do an interview um, so that i can familiarize myself with it and i can just see different things every time i read it and after some time has gone by i see different things in it um, but at the time you know other people said that sounded like a trick because it wasn't free will uh, you know my free will was being manipulated so at the time, um, you know, I gave her the benefit of the doubt. I just wasn't really sure. But over time, I've realized that the, the uh, alien agenda is basically um, exploitation. Okay, so um, you do realize that manipula manipulation is uh, a human trait also, right? Yes. Okay, so um, the mantis or mantids, however you want to call it, whatever you want to call them, may be manipulative, but doesn't necessarily mean that they're evil. Or they, let me, how would I put this? They could be manipulative and have their own agenda and be self centered and self serving. However, uh, that kind of describes humans a lot, too. It really does. So it doesn't mean they're necessarily worse than we are. It just means they've got their own reason for doing what they're doing, and most beings do. I think uh, that they're, you know, the the probably I'm guessing that the probably the majority of beings in the universe have the physical beings have a. Um, have a strong desire to live and therefore they have their own at some level they're going to have their own agenda and be self-serving to a point uh even you know they might 
they're not Mother Teresa, but they're not Jeffrey Dahmer, obviously. Right, right. So anyway, uh, back to your story. So um, you had another experience with the mantid that hit you in your privates and made you go to sleep by pointing at you. Is there any other details in that encounter? That you want to uh, yeah this one, seemed, this one seemed like a male um only i guess because of whatever emotions he was giving out to me he seemed male like as opposed to female they very specifically wanted me to feel you know i got maybe comforted by the female entity before and then this time they're like nope you know we're, we mean business we're gonna have some male essence come in and just show her who's boss. I mean, that's how it felt like to me. So you think it was like good cop, bad cop? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so, so are those the only two mantage experiences you've remembered? Uh, it's the only ones you know, I saw with my own eyes in my bedroom without, you know, regression or looking back. Well, don't, don't discount your regression stuff because I, as a hypnotist, I, I, trust somebody's regression more than I trust their conscious mind. Okay. Uh, their con you know, if you sat right now and recalled your experiences and you did the same under your regression, I would trust the same experience under regression before I would trust your conscious recall. Okay. So don't discount those. But uh, if you have other mantid or mantis experiences that you got under regression, please do tell. Um, well, like I said, with the, uh, a lot of times I had experiences in very large buildings, like as if they were underground though. Um, so like a hangar, like a airplane hangar. Um, this isn't in the book either, but you know, I kept finding myself in airplane hangars being attended to by do human doctors, a lot of, and a lot of reptilians also in military facilities. And they would be, you know, at certain times in my life, um, I used to I used to have very thick glasses that I wore and, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to see anything. And it was because I had my glasses off, you know, stuff like that. Um, but anyway, I'd be in uh, hospital beds. Uh, so I've been spending a lot of a lot of my um, memories, either regression or otherwise, are all uh, being in hospitals. So, um, so being operated on by praying mantis or other beings plus humans. So, so the connection when I said other mantis experiences was there were mantids there in those events. So it sounds like a, a, uh, my, my lab experience where your my labs were involving both humans and aliens, and that does correlate with uh, like the last person I interviewed or the person, yeah, I think it was the last lady I interviewed, uh, she mentioned, uh, there's a lady out of New Zealand, she mentioned that her my labs involved both humans and aliens, and that also correlates with other people I've interviewed uh, who said the same thing about their my lab experiences. So um, since you brought it up, let's go with your my lab experiences. Uh, tell us any, um, your my lab experiences, do you, you, do you get most of that knowledge through regression or without it? Most uh, with regression, but it seems that um, a lot of it, all I remember are mostly hospital visits, uh, you know, or um, I was told by uh, Kimberly McGeorge, I don't know if you know her, but she told me that I was given. I, I, know, who she, I know who she is. I don't know her person. Okay. Uh, she told me that I was given spider DNA. And so, I mean, that could be the spider connection, but basically uh, I'm always in a, um, I'm either in underground facilities or underwater facilities, um, and I'm being operated on. And they're adding things or subtracting things. Um, right now I have uh, an eye implant or some type of implant in my eye. Um, it's in my right eye, and it's like an orb that revolves around my eye. 
And it turns on at various times. I never know when it's going to turn on. I don't know what it is. It feels like somebody, something's looking through my eyes. Um, it drives me crazy. I actually want it out, actually. Um, so I don't know where I got that, but I imagine I got it through a MyLab. Um, so a lot of times I'm in, 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 in Antarctica. Um, so hold on. Stop. Uh, keep that thought. Don't lose your Antarctica. Why do you think you got your eye implant through my lab? Because any type of being with the sufficient technology can put that in you, and it doesn't have to involve humans or my labs. Where do, where do you get that connection? Because it started, it appeared after I'd had an eye surgery. Um, in 2015, I ha or actually 2012, I had vitreous detachment. And so in my right you had, you had what? Vitreous detachment. Which means? Which means um, that the lining of your eye falls down. It's like the lining of your car, uh, your ceiling falls down, and you can't see out the rear of your mirror. It's similar with your eye. So what can you explain in, in a more dumbed-down version? Um, that is the dumbed-down version. So oh, my God. Inside your eye. You have lining, and the lining fell down and was like. Oh, you mean the, you mean the, like, like the covering of your eye. Yes, and so actually it happened in both eyes, but this was my weak eye. My right eye was my weak eye, so I decided to go and get it looked at, and they decided decided I needed a vitrectomy, which takes out all that stuff, and it sucks out all of the fluid in the eye, and then they put saline in. So they take out your lining permanently? Yeah. Okay, because you don't need it. It's Right. It's like your fingernails. You don't really need it. Right. Okay, go ahead. So then um, I had an eye surgery, and uh, then unknown to that, unknowns to everyone, my eyes started going crazy, and um, it, it went to high, really high eye pressure. Um, so then I had another surgery, and um, they zapped some of the they lasered some of the fluid producing things in the eye so that it didn't overproduce so that my eye pressure wouldn't go too high and I would get glaucoma but um, at some point a week after my surgery uh, my pupils stopped working <laughs> so I had everything was fine but a week afterwards my pupil will not constrict anymore and also um, I started having this round thing <laughs> my eye um and nobody can see it nobody can you describe knows it. it can you describe when it comes on how you see it uh, um, in slightly sure. more detail okay so like when you rub your eye and you can see that little round orb in your eye when you rub it um it looks like that but i'm not rubbing my eye it's moving and it's going around in a circle sometimes it's both eyes, so it goes from one side to the other, um, and uh, it sometimes looks like... It sounds like you have an implant in both eyes. eyes. Not, I not. think so, too, yeah. Okay. The one in the right eye is really bright. Um, I can turn it off by turning my head to the right, so when I'm trying to sleep, because a lot of times it turns on while I'm in the dark. Um, <clears throat> and how does that look? How, does, how do you experience that? I experience it as if a flashlight is next to my eye pointing at it while I'm trying to sleep. So so you see um, some light that shouldn't be there next to your eye. Correct. Okay, so go uh, and I don't know that you actually made the connection between you, there was what was I forgot my last question. What was the question I just gave you? Uh, I don't know. Oh, you about how I experienced the no, light. No, I don't mean I don't mean that. I mean the question where you got into your eye. Uh, oh, uh, I, don't <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, forget that for now. Uh, go back to your Antarctic experience. Start okay. from the beginning of that and go through far as, as far as you can. Okay, well, at some point I realized I'm underwater. I am uh, in uh, a building. It has, um, it's like in a, like we have to take a jelly, like this is how I, I always describe it, some sort of jelly-like 
um, craft to go under the water to uh, get into this facility. And um, we get into the facility, it's actually operating rooms everywhere. Um, a lot of the operating doors have um, look like portal windows on them. They're green on the inside. There are a lot of uh, aliens in there. There's spiders and also military people. There's doctors. They're all wearing white coats. Um, they operate on me at various times. And they you are- You got this from a, a dream or from regression? Or regression, or memory? yeah. Uh, regression, okay, go ahead. Keep and going. Um, there is um, like a train, it's a training facility as well. So they train people or, you know, how to breathe underwater is one of the things. Um, so how did you connect it with Antarctica? Um, just because of all the snow and um, all of the... So you got to go outside? Yeah, yes. I've gone outside because I've tried to figure out... In my book, I talk about a round white light, but it's not a light source. It's just a round about this big um, light source. And um, I was trying to figure out where is that coming from? And I ended up in Antarctica. So um, so I realized oh, I- Oh, so, okay, stop. So you, you uh, did a, used a remote viewing technique to go from, you, you, you were somehow experiencing a light and you used a remote viewing technique to take you to where the light relates from. Right. Okay, and which, who's, uh, I guess we're gonna have to jump from Antarctica to remote viewing. So <laughs> tell us your, uh, who's, it was uh, the guy here in uh, Atlanta, uh, oh, what is his name? Um, what, whose mode viewing technique do you use? Well, I, I I don't use any at this point, but you know. Um, well, then when you did that, when, you did when that. I did that, I was using Stuart Swerdlow's. Uh, oh, his technique. Yes, but the remote viewing, actually, I tried David Morehouse and also Lynn Buchanan. Okay, so you, when you went from the light to Antarctica. What technique did you use? Which, whether it was a Stuart Swerdlow's technique or Lens or uh, David Morehouse's, which technique did you use? How did you learn it? And what exactly did you do? Um, I used Stuart Swerdlow's technique and I focused, uh, I used this technique called the Green Spiral Staircase out of Stuart Swerdlow's book. Also, how one again? <laughs> go ahead, yeah. go on. The Hyperspace Helper to look at my <clears throat> this why this white light was so important to me and the way I used it was I used it by thinking in, in my mind uh, uh first putting in my um a royal blue circle with a, a dot in the middle so it looks kind of like a target in my pineal gland and I put myself my whole entire body in the medium green for memory and I imagined myself walking down a green spiral staircase until I felt like I should stop after when I was concentrating on the white light and at that time I knew I was at the right memory and I walked out and I looked for the scene in front of me that would show me why this white light was so important and it showed me that I was underwater at a facility. Uh, I was a both a training facility and a also a um, medical facility. Um, the training facility had different schools. Um, it seemed like it had a school for training kids psychic abilities, um, but in my case, they were putting screws in my skull and having me pass out so that I would disassociate um, and learn how to do that. Um, and then uh, the little kids in the class would help me. On the other side of the room, there was a um, surgery room. That's when they were doing the, the drilling on the scalp and the head. 
Um, and so then there was also training facilities for uh, underwater training, training how to breathe underwater. So you didn't use a remote viewing technique, you used a regression technique? Yes. Okay. Uh, st um, spiral staircase is, is a particular, his version of uh, common re uh, hypnotic regression technique. Uh, right. Down a staircase. I, I used to use uh, a staircase technique myself. Or no, staircase or moving escalator, either way. Um, so the, when you did that and you stepped into the, you, you were going down the staircase, you stopped at a particular scene. Right. And you stepped into that scene, yes? Yes. Okay. So what did the scene look like before you stepped into it? Um, I usually didn't see a scene before I stepped into it. And when I stepped into it, by that I mean I was looking at a screen and it showed up. So I wasn't stepping into the scene. There was a screen. And when I stopped and walked over to the screen, that's when the uh, image showed up there. And how, before you used his uh, blue dot in the middle of your head and spiral staircase technique, uh, how deep would you say you had to make yourself before you started using those techniques? Um, what do you mean, how deep? You mean like... Oh, okay, so um, generally hypnotists start with since that's a regression technique, I would assume that prior to the regression technique, there's some deepening uh, in, induction done. That's what hypnotists do before they regress people. Now, that's not. I'm not saying that Sw Stuart does that in his book or that you did it in your technique. All I'm saying is that that's how hypnotists do their technique in general. Now, there are hypnotists who don't feel that you need to relax at all to use their technique. They just use like NLP type thing where you're not really inducing relax physical or any type of relaxation. They just go straight into the, <clears throat> the technique. And that may be what you did. I'm just trying to determine if you if you relaxed yourself before using the technique. Um, I would take some deep breaths before, and then I would just um, jump right into it. Yeah, pretty much jump right into it. But the funny thing was, is a lot, not every time that I would actually get a scene. Other times I couldn't see anything. Um, it depended on, I think, how deep the memory was, if there were any blocks on my memory, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, during this Antarctic experience where they put screws in the back of your head and they you had children in a room you were yeah with. uh how much besides what you just stated how much more of that event can you relate if anything um i just remembered that there was a lot of fear and uh with the kids other kids in the in that room um, I remember we were you know working really hard at trying to give these aliens and people what they wanted you know we were trying to be good girls and good boys um it was really scary and frightening and tense so, so uh cops of aliens how many um i don't know it was a pretty busy facility there were you know um, praying mantis, there were some beetles, there was a guy that looked like a stork, there was spiders, there were spiders wearing people suits, and they weren't, uh, couldn't, you couldn't tell that they were... Back up. Say that again, there were spiders wearing, wearing people, people suits. suits. That's how I, I saw it, you know, so they somehow made their appearance to be look human looking, maybe they were shapeshifters, I don't know. But a lot of them wanted me to think that I was talking to people when I was actually talking to, <coughs> excuse me, aliens. So 
you know, they would move their mouth as if they were talking, but it was actually through my mind that they were talking to me. But they wanted me to remember that I was talking to a person and that they were using their mouth to talk to me, not using their our minds to talk. But, but they were spiders. Yes, spiders. Well, that is an odd. I don't think I've had that. I don't think anybody's <laughs> described that one yet. That's a new one. Uh, so, uh, how long, if you had to characterize how long you were in that Antarctic facility based on the event you just related, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the one one time, not okay, right. you were taken there multiple times, but during that one event, how long do you think you were there? Just guessing based on uh, what you've learned so far. Probably two days, three days. And they put screws in the back of your head? Yeah, and I actually have indentations in my skull <laughs> for where that happened. And the, and what were the screws for again? I don't know. I think they were trying to, they were just doing experimentation. I mean, that's what I, my uh, feeling okay. is. So they, they were just trying to see what would happen if they screwed screws in the back of your head? Yes, and would you dissociate? Would you would you be able to take your mind elsewhere while you were having this pain? Oh, I see what you're saying. They're testing you for pain endurance and for how your brain functions and a few other things, probably. Probably. Um, and so you had and the list of beings again: humans, uh, mantids, uh, spiders. Uh, and what else? And then I saw some beetles, and I thought saw some, what some stork looked like guy. a stork, a stork yeah. guy and beetles. Yeah. So describe the beetles. The beetles just look like regular beetles that uh, were brown, and um, I don't really remember their heads. But um, and a lot of times, and this is one of my problems, is that a lot of times in my regressions, the faces are blur are are blurred. It's like I can't see the face. So yeah, that's uh, my one abductee uh, client who was used as a breeder for the grays. She had the same thing. She could see a lot of things, but one of the most obvious things that they blocked was um, that she couldn't see the, the, their faces. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's typical. So, um, so go to another alien experience that you've had. Um, okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, you read my book. Ask me about one of my alien experiences. <laughs> you mean from the book? <laughs> Well, yeah, because I just read it, and um, memory, m human memory is a very interesting thing, isn't it? It is. It's really hard to uh, describe how interesting. You, it humans is. are not made to memorize. Yeah, we're not designed that way. Um, you could read your book probably every day, all day for the rest of your life, and not memorize the whole book. I know. Because it's just a bunch of words on a page that your mind. Uh, you know, I could take you, I could put you in trance, take you back to the moment you read the book, start reading the book, take you through the reading of the book, and tell you, give you affirmations that you're going to remember, remember every part of the book as you're reading it. And you would actually probably remember it much better. But that'd be <laughs> yeah. a lot of work just for to memorize the book. Yeah. So anyway. Okay. So anyway, well, um, let me tell you. So some of my experiences are not um, ET, don't seem to be ET related. They might be re related to remote viewing. I'm not sure. So when I was 10 years old, um, I lived in Turkey and I was um, walking up. Uh, I kept waking up or every night when I, before I went to sleep, I would um, have a daydream. And that's how I thought of it because I didn't have any words for this. But the daydream would be uh, the same every time. So it wasn't anything special. It was just basically that I would meet a friend and she would say these specific things. 
So every single night, this specific dream, daydream would pop up and I would not be able to figure out why um, or get rid of it. I couldn't get rid of it. It just kept showing up. So uh, at the end of that week. Um, this was when you were 10? Yeah, when I was 10, it happened. Okay, go ahead. And then it stopped. So, um, so I don't know if that was a remote view. Uh, told, somebody told me it was a remote view. So I was doing remote viewing like spontaneously. So when you say daydream, you mean you're sitting there kind of relaxing your mind and tell me, okay, so I, I can't visualize. I, I visualized colors in my head once in my whole life. It only happened one time and I've never, if you put a gun to my head and said visualize X, you just have to pull the trigger because I couldn't visualize X. So most people are not like me who most people can visualize. So um, your daydream, how did you experience it? Visually or partially visually or? It was visual, I, completely visual in color. Okay, well, visual as in you can see it uh, out in front of you or you can, uh, you've actually gone into the vision itself. When you say visual, can you be a little more? What I uh, mean is it was in my mind as I was daydreaming as if I was, that was something that I would normally do. Like, let's say I was saying, tomorrow I'm going to go and play with those kids that I met. And I would visualize myself doing that. You know, we're going to play this game. We're going to play that game, right? I can do that. So I, um, but this one wasn't mine. It was not my <laughs> memory. It was not my daydream. It just showed up. So you had a, a daydream that you actually stepped into as an experience or that, you know, how how real was it to you? How all enveloping your consciousness was it? Were you actually there in, in this place, uh, you know, as in or were you more aware of your current existence and it was just something you were thinking about sort of? Partially, visually, you're my drift, right? Yeah, I guess so. Um, I don't know, because if you think, if other people think about how they daydream, right? They're trying to read a boring book and then what? A dream, a daydream pops up, right? It's sort of similar. I was. They're, they're to attempting to visualize something in the book and they might succeed, they might not. Oh, quite. Or let's say they're not. Let's say they're reading calculus. And they're not visualizing it. They're just sitting there. And all of a sudden, all the things they could be doing pops into their mind. That's what I mean. Well, in that case, in my version of that case, I would just be having thoughts. I wouldn't actually see anything. Uh, in your case, uh, you're actually seeing all right. this place. And you actually are experiencing it as if you were there. Correct. Okay, so it's fully enveloping your awareness. Right, it is. Okay, do you have any awareness of your body at the time, this, your current body at the time this happens? I don't think so. Okay, so you went fully into a daydream which was all enveloping in which you stepped into completely in your mind. All right. And took you basically away from your current existence. Yes. But, okay, so, and this happened... At the age of 10, how often did it happen? How Every night for a week. Okay. And what conclusions did you come to in reference to where it came from, what it meant, or anything about it? At that time, I didn't have any uh, indication of what that was, but at the end of the week, that actually happened. That you mean the event week. occurred? Yes, the event okay. occurred. So, so you were having a precognitive uh, association. I guess, yeah. You you stepped, basically what you did was you stepped with your awareness into the future. You pulled the future to you into your present. Okay. Okay. And uh, I have seen the future uh, twice. And one of those times I was seeing it visually, but it wasn't in my head. It was... I was driving down the street and I saw an image of a person walking down a street, down the street, who was 2D, uh, 
uh, I, there, there was height and width, but no depth. Like it was on a, uh, projecting on a screen. It was outside my head. It was in the car, and I couldn't see through it. And uh, when it disappeared, I kept going around this curve. I got into my lane. I was in the the middle of my car was on the center lane. I wasn't in my lane. And I had this vision uh, external to my body, and um, and I when I saw the the guy from the from the knees up in the middle of my hood, it was a guy in a, a, a trench coat. He, uh, like I said, I couldn't see through him. He was flat. It was two dimensional height and depth, and, but uh, I it was I was seeing him from an angle as if I was in front of him, but hanging out above his head, looking down on him at like a 45 degree angle where he's below me. And I could see him and I could see a uh, yellow uh, line intermittently going at a 45 degree angle, up, degree angle up into the sky. So then it disappeared and I realized that this is a guy walking down the middle of the street. So I was at my car, the middle of my car on the center line and taking up both lanes, coming and going. So I got into my lane, slowed down, and continued going around this long, curving road. And when I got, before I got to the apex of this road, I thought about it and I was like, I thought, well, I, I just saw a guy walking down the middle of the street. Maybe there's a guy walking down the middle of the street at the end of this curve. That's why I got into my lane, slowed down. And when I got, to the apex coming out of this turn, the guy that I saw was standing there. Wow. And I was seeing an out-of-body entity of a living person in real time. I was not seeing the future. And that's a com not as uncommon as you might think. It is. It uh, has been known to occur seeing an out-of-body entity of a living person. That's in the parapsychological, parapsychology, parapsychology journals. Okay. Uh, of America or, or UK, where uh, one of the two. Anyway, uh, another time I saw the future, I was uh, driving my father's Lincoln Continental Mark IV and saw the future uh, maybe 10, 15 seconds into the future. In, in my vision, I actually saw that one external also. And it was two dimensional and I couldn't see through it also. And um, and I had to look around it. I was going in reverse in a, on a dirt road or a dirt trail in the middle of the woods in between some trees. And I saw myself turn and hit a tree. And then the vision went, it was like I was seeing it from the back seat of the car. And then it disappeared. I was like, well, I better be careful. I don't want to turn and hit a tree. So I waited till all the trees were gone. And then I turned and hit the tree. Oh, no. So I was seeing the future, which I didn't change. Whereas the previous one, I was seeing my future in real time by looking at an object that was I was about to come upon in my future. But I was looking at it in real time, not as a future event. It was a future event for me, but I wasn't seeing the future. Okay, so it's all kind of confusing, but uh, the reason why I brought all that up is because you're, you brought the future into your mind in the present tense, but it was the future you were seeing. And so have you ever seen the future uh, in other, uh, has that, is that the only time you've seen the future? Or have you no, seen, the future? seen the future? I didn't realize I was seeing the future, but in that term but yes I saw the future again um I was 16 and um I started having the daydream you know that I was going to move to a foreign country um my dad moved us around a lot and every year or two and I was in my senior I was in my junior year of high school and I was really didn't want to did not want to move because I didn't want to have to go to a new school but yep I moved <laughs> I moved to a foreign country I moved to the Philippines so so when you saw the future that time, uh, what was it you were seeing that you were going to move? Yeah, I, what I saw was that um, 
I saw, uh, well, I had uh, a classmate that had moved to South Africa and then had moved back. And I started thinking, oh, wow, how, I mean, I started thinking, oh, she's just like me, you know. She moved to a foreign country and now she's coming back. Um, and then, then that kept coming back over and over that same daydream, those same thoughts over and over. And then eventually... I but in that instance, were you seeing the future or were you just thinking about the future? I don't know. No, see, I don't think of it like this. So it's interesting to think of it like this, the way you're thinking of it. Um, so I guess what I was seeing, maybe it was a possibility. Um, but And maybe I was thinking about my feelings about it, but I didn't want it to happen. So uh, for a while, I thought that that came up because I made it happen because I thought about it. <laughs> You know, because so I didn't want that. Basically, in the second event, you were you knew the future, but you weren't actually seeing it. I guess, yeah. And in the first one, you were seeing it. And go back to the first one. You what were you seeing again? I was just seeing a uh, friend walking up the street and would say specific things to me. You actually saw. You were like standing outside and the guy walked up and said yeah. some things right and you saw that in your head and then in the future uh he uh, god did exactly what you saw right okay all right so one case you knew the future another case you saw the future i guess yeah sounds like i mean i'm just trying so. to wrap my mind around it so uh or our minds i guess uh so Go to another event in your life, which is interesting. Doesn't have to be alien related, but uh, anything that uh, would entertain our audience. Um, let me see. Um, in, you know, well, I moved around a lot and um, I moved to the Louisiana. I hated it so much and I couldn't wait to move. And then we moved to California. How about that? <laughs> so, where were you living in Louisiana that was not uh, to your liking? We were li living in Louisiana, in Gretna, Louisiana, and we were across the bridge from New Orleans. And um, it just was hard because I had moved, lived in other southern states, and uh, Louisiana was a kind of gritty and hard to get along with the people. They didn't have the same southern accent as I had, and they were very um, suspicious <laughs> and uh, not very friendly. And it was just a, like a cold Par shock. They were a little paranoid? No, not unfriendly. Unfriendly. And they were uh, just seemed to be very, yeah, maybe they were suspicious. I don't know if they were paranoid, but they didn't trust me because my accent wasn't the same as theirs. And that's something you run into a lot when you move around, because if you're not from there... You can't be trusted. Well, I figured that <laughs> suspicion is a symptom of paranoia. Oh, okay. Uh, because if you're suspicious of anybody or anything, you know, your brain is working, but it's also leaning towards uh, sort of uh, judging them as being a negative thing. All right. And, you know, and why would you judge somebody as being negative if you don't really know anything about them? Unless you have a sort of a leaning, a bent leaning towards, you know, why is this person here or why are they around me? Or, you know, to me, that sort of paranoid, but that's just my opinion. So do you have any other interesting parts of your life that you wish to discuss? Oh, before you, uh, mind goes off into any other tangent, you do believe you're a... Um, targeted individual yes yes okay so let's explore that since we've explored aliens we've explored seeing and knowing the future and um uh, let's explore your um how do we call what do we what do we call uh people being tracked or targeted is that is that that my lab is only a t piece of that you What's the larger thing called? What would you call that? Uh, mind control is another piece. 
there's all these different pieces. But what do you call the whole construct? I call it targeting. That's what okay, I call it. So let's go over targeting then. All right. Um, well, targeting is really sucky. Um, go, for, go, the, go to the beginning of your. Okay. Well, um, you know, when you, they track your phone, they track your computer. Um, they know where you are at every minute of the day. Um, I think they implant us actually. Um, then they, um, they come to your house. They move so your you stuff. Think they're, you think they're human implants? Um, yes, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe it's the aliens putting them in for the humans. I don't know. Now, wouldn't the think about this? Wouldn't it be so great if we could use the aliens as a cover for our covert human activities? Well, in a sense, that is what's happening because um, I have. Let's see. Uh, f the last two people I've interviewed have gotten into uh, into the notion that when they were my lab, it wasn't just the last two, it's actually three or four people I've interviewed who all stated that during their my labs, they the aliens were working with humans. So we, as humans, we have natural tendency to believe that the aliens are taken as and then the humans are taken as but they're separate but right. my understanding based on my interviews is that during the my labs it's it's humans and aliens working together so if you take that logic and understanding and move it forward uh then you have to come to an understanding of or come to a question of is the aliens in charge of the humans during these my labs or is the humans in charge of the aliens during the my labs and my understanding based on my i guess it's my last interview is that it's definitely the aliens in charge during the my labs so the, even the my labs according to what i've learned so far now i could be wrong but just based on what i've learned so far the aliens are in charge of the my labs uh, also, not just the alien abductions. So, if uh, that's the truth, then you know you have to. You, you're going to want to expand that into well, who's running the planet? Is it aliens? Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know you might come to that conclusion, but then if you expand it even further, you might want to ask the question: Well, is it aliens in charge, or is it disincarnate forces? that are not physical in charge like evil spirits or or uh you know things that like higher level beings like like uh daryl talks about uh daryl sims talks about the grays working for beings of light so if you take aliens and go up different levels uh they become less and less physical and more and more light and uh so you get into all kinds of the more you learn the more questions you have yeah so instead of me talking let's get back to you and uh now that you've heard me talk too much what what do you uh what area would you like to discuss in reference to your targeting you know we uh, the, your audience probably at least my audience, the audience, the people who would listen to this probably have some idea of MK Ultra. They have some idea of my labs. They have some idea of uh, mind control in general, even if it's not accurate. They have a, a piece of all of those. So give us some understanding of being targeted from your perspective that your that my audience would not have are that they wouldn't already understand if you get my drift sure okay so um i joined a self-defense gym and uh, because i was being targeted okay so i was being targeted i was being followed everywhere i went um someone hacked my phone someone hacked my computer uh the person who hacked my phone was actually in a restaurant with me and they sent something to my my phone i don't know how they did that so a lot of these things, you don't know how they happen. Um, 
So I started going to a self-defense gym and I went for a while. Um, and um, recently I got a voice to skull message that someone was going there to pick me up. Now, um, I had gotten a message prior to that um, in my mind, so FYI, um, that I was, uh, you know, going, there might be some trouble there. So I went um, to the uh, gym anyway, and but I brought my gun because I started carrying a gun because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Um, just for my personal safety. Um, and when I got there, uh, I hear, oh, she's here now, but she brought her gun. I'm telling her now. Um, so these are the th kind of things that happen. So I haven't gone back to my gym because I don't know why they're following me there. Uh, since they hacked my phone, they could have been uh, known that I would be at that gym. Um, but um, so that's one of the things. Uh, they keep giving me, um, they put stuff in your food, um, so I keep catching, um, like, dysentery, or for lack of a better word, um, E. coli is in my food, and it gives me diarrhea, um, but when I try to send out to, to find out what's going on, if I try to send my, um, you know, at-home tests to out to FedEx, FedEx, it disappeared off of their system, um, I sent it through um, UPS, and it disappeared for two months. And the t and the testing kit was only good for three days. Um, so these are the kinds of things that happen. It's not just so easy to say, "Oh well, you know, just don't worry about it." Maybe you're paranoid. So, so go back to the very first moment that you believed you were being targeted. What what it was happening? In that uh, moment. Okay, I was being followed all the time on the road. So, but you were being followed a particular time, which a particular there's a particular event that there was the first event that you thought, oh, there's this person following me. You had a first event. Do you remember yeah. your first event? I remember that. Um, I was just driving down the street. Someone was following me really closely. I made a U-turn. They made a U-turn. I made another U-turn. They made a U-turn. I remember that I drove to my doctor's. They followed me all the way there. And I made U-turns. And I eventually... Can you describe them? Um, you know, I, I started taking pictures of their license plates. But um, so a lot of them are have really, really dark tinted windows. They're dark tinted on the driver's side window, so you can't see who it is. The only way you can see it is through your rear view mirror. Um, so um, they followed me to my doctor's office, so I started taking pictures of their license plates. I started taking pictures of them. How close have you gotten to them at the closest point? Um, well, this one lady followed me all the way to my doctor's office, and I was she was going like this, trying to keep me from seeing her. Um, so I took her picture and then I took a picture of her license plate. Um, they followed me to restaurants when they're walking back and forth, trying to make me it obvious that they're following me, you know. So are these just uh, normal looking people or is there anything? Yeah, it, they're normal. Uh, you know, I've heard very strange um, descriptions of, of MIBS and I'm, I'm not, you know, in a way we think of MIBS as being a, an urban myth, but I'm sure that there are, in fact, I'm almost positive there are people I've interviewed that have mentioned they had them, but I don't remember off the top of my head. So uh, is, is there anything extremely odd of any kind about any of these followers that you can recall? Well, most Other than they're following you? Most of them are women. Um, they all seem to be trained by law enforcement, the way they follow people. You know, they either follow them really far away. They won't stop. So if you stop at a light, uh, they'll stop right in your blind spot. They don't stop right next to you. You know, they do a lot of odd things, but they are regular looking people. They're not, um, you know, men in black per se. They're just trained in a very specific way of how to follow people. 
So you believe that they're just humans in a black project somewhere? Yes, or they have a job, you know, like that's their job is to follow people. It's their job to come into your house and to steal stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, so that's if, I if you could describe them from a very mundane, not, uh, not, you know, out of this world type of description, um, could they be working for somebody who's fairly normal, like the FBI, CIA, or intel, an intel agency or anything like that? I would think so. I mean, don't they all look normal? I mean, like normal people? Well, okay, so um, my point is I'm just trying to figure out whether I, the people following you and the people targeting you, the same people, could easily be just uh, – FBI, CIA, Intel, trying to figure out what's going on with your abductions and and other your alien contacts and your whatever things that you're. If if all your alien contacts are true, and I'm not saying they're not, let's just say for a moment everything you've said so far is accurate and truthful. If that if that's the case, then I would assume that somebody in our government would be wanting to track you as much as possible so they could get as much information about the people taking you, the aliens taking you, just like as in a my lab, but uh, just at a more average level. You get my drift. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think about all that things I've said? Do you think these are somebody who's at a regular level just trying to figure out about your alien stuff or do you get some other more nefarious drift from the whole scenario it seems more nefarious to me because a lot of it seems to be just to be annoying you know what i mean i mean just for me to know that i'm being followed you know they're not approaching so you're saying they're in some on some level they're avoiding your knowing and other levels they're making it obvious right they're making it obvious for a reason they want me to know that they're not doing anything about it I don't know what their real agenda is. Um, I did start carrying a gun because I felt menaced by these people. I mean, I don't know what their intentions are. I don't want, um, you know, I want to be feel like I am safe, right? And I think that's their goal is to make me feel unsafe everywhere. Now, the thing is, is and this is what I don't understand, is that um, they have my phone. They know where I am at every minute of every day because they can track my phone. They possibly have an implant inside of me, so they know where I am. So why do they have to have this show of force? They don't. It's just for intimidation. That's what I think. Okay, so they're, they're um, trying to make you paranoid or worse. Yes. All right. right. Yes. All right. So... Um, is there anything else you want to say to the audience regarding their activities before we move on to anything else that we could talk about? Um, I would just like to say that if you're being targeted, I'm really sorry. And um, there are uh, organizations for people who are targeted um, and they're trying to get it to stop because apparently we've been put on some terrorist watch list. Apparently that is a possibility for people to terrorize us basically like this, is that they're terrorizing us when they're, we're on a terrorist watch list um, or a suspected terrorist watch list. That's what I understand from uh, targetedjustice.com. Um, so uh, if you're in this situation, um, there is help and there are organizations to help out as much as possible, but it's not your fault and um, and the people that do this, and that's their job to do this, are evil buttheads. So, and they should own that. So, so before we move on, give us an event that cemented in your mind that you weren't just being paranoid, that it was real, that their targeting you was not just your fear of, you know, things in general or paranoia in general. What? Give us an event, uh, go through an event where you knew without any doubt whatsoever you were being followed. Just one event. That was something that stands out in your mind. 
You know, I get followed, like I said, all the time. Um, uh, just, just something that comes to mind. Yeah, um, right, I'm trying to get something to come to mind. Um, well, you know, now that you've changed my mind about whether what I saw with that daydream, it's really changing how I think about things. Um, so, um, well, uh, I'll just, I just drive and, uh, you know, somebody makes all my turns. I mean, that's well, how you, you, you did mention a while ago that you, you had a person following you, you made a U-turn twice and they made a U-turn twice. Can you go through that event with a little sure, more? Sure, sure. Um, there was had a doctor's appointment. I, you know, pulled out of my neighborhood. There was a person behind me. They, we, I made a left. They made a left. You know. Um, then we drive down the street, get on the freeway. They're still behind me. I can see them. They're, you know, going in and out. You know, behind me. And then I turn on to my doctor's appointment, or you know, on the street where my doctor is. They were there. I made the U-turn. They made the U-turn. I made the U-turn again. I couldn't believe they were still behind me. So then I turned into my doctor's office and I got out of my car and they drove off. Um, well, that, that sounds like a real event. The fact that you were able to detail it like that lets me and my audience know that you're not just paranoid, that it's good that you you gave that much detail because it, it uh, helps your case as being that you're not only, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're saying. So it's good that you mentioned, <laughs> you know, it's good that you mentioned that. I mean, people don't have to believe about aliens, but they can uh, certainly know that somebody can see if somebody's following them and if they keep following, that's not something your mind is necessarily going to make up. Right. But, uh, it's not that interesting to make up, you know. But anyway, uh, so what we've talked about aliens, we've talked about being targeted. We've talked about seeing the future. Uh, what else is interesting about your life that you would like to relate at this time? Um, I would say that um, I did try remote viewing. I don't think it's all that it's cracked up to be. Um, I think there is a big organization trying to keep people who are really good at remote viewing from a remote viewing. And um, you know, I had some bad experiences with it, and so um, be careful if you do remote viewing, and um, be safe. Well, the remote viewers, um, I forgot who it was that said that they remote viewed some aliens, and then uh, the aliens realized that they were there at the time it was occurring in real time, and and they, I don't remember what exactly how it finished transpiring, but um, I've heard something along the lines of what you're talking about, that, you know, if you remote view certain beings that regardless of whether it's the past or the future, you're literally there. If you're seeing them, uh, you're in the future, you're in the past, and they can pick you up at that event, just as if it was real time when you were physically there. Right. So anyway, uh, what else would you like to discuss? That, um, um, I would also, well, I also still do want to discuss the remote viewing. The thing is, is that, you know, remote viewing isn't very uh, no, well known to most people, but a lot of remote viewers do it for the money. But that the, there, it is a serious thing. And yeah, the ETs can tell immediately that you're there. And uh, it's no secret to them. So you never know what you're going to pull into your life by well, using since remote you, viewing. Since you went down that road, let's continue <laughs> down that road. Uh, oh, is that bait? Uh, so you obviously have had somebody that you remote viewed pick you up. It yeah. sounds like. Okay, so... Take us through that experience, what you were doing and how that played out. All right. So um, I was using uh, David Morehouse's, not to plug in, but David Morehouse's CD. He has a CD. 
Now, uh, a lot of the stuff that's in the CD is actually subliminal. Now, I didn't know that. But anyway, so you're listening to the CD, and then you try to remote view. So I was trying to figure out where, um, who had worked on my computer, who had hacked my computer. And so what I did was I went through the sequence of listening to the music and then, you know, trying to relax my mind and, you know, do it, do the remote viewing. And um, I was in a skiff. Actually, I found myself at a skiff. So it's a, what is a special compartmentalized something facility? Is that what a skiff is? Specialized or, uh, no, I think it's uh, it's secure compartmented information facility. Okay, all right. Well, it didn't have any windows. I mean, that's what it looked like. I don't know that it was. But anyway, I did see this person that I thought attacked my computer. And um, I also saw this person that looked like a, I don't know, they looked angry. They had like pointy eyebrows and a pointy face. Anyway, I was there. I, I didn't know if it actually worked, you know, because and this person suddenly looked at me and I was freaked out. So I came out of it and, um, you know, didn't wonder if I had well, back, back, back up, back up. So um, go through the technique that you used before you saw the person who saw you there. Go through the actual technique itself. Okay, basically you listen to the music and then you have your hand on a paper and you put a little squiggle on it. Um, and the squiggle is supposedly the signal line of the event you're trying to see. And um, then you trace over the signal line and you feel certain points. And at some point you might be able to feel something. And when you are, then you uh, uh, get to the scene or the place that you want it to be. And... Uh, that's the technique. What what exactly were you looking for and why at the time? I was just looking for the person to see the person that hacked my computer. That was my whole goal. So I don't know why I went there because I didn't mean to go to her work if that's where she was. Um, I it was weird. It was just so do you do you, situation. Do you feel like you um, you actually. Uh, sort of astral projected to, I call it astral projected, you, you can call it anything you want. You went with your awareness completely to their office, yes? Yes. Okay. And when you were in their office and you could see them, uh, there's a whole bunch of questions. A, what awareness of yourself did you notice, were you just a point of awareness or did you as a being have any uh, awareness of yourself at that time? Before you answer that, what did they look like and play out the, finish playing out the event? Um, the feeling was that I was sort of like on the ceiling or, you know, not on the ceiling, but like floating around, you know, like a bug, you know, <laughs> kind of like that, but I was... I was just, I felt like I was just floating around. I was in a room. There were people milling around, and I did see her. And um, she had a coworker. And human, a human. Yeah. Well, she was a human, but he, I don't think, was. I think he was an alien. No, okay, so great. You stopped talking about aliens, but you went back into an alien experience. Sorry. Uh, that's a good, no, that's a good thing, because I'm trying to get you talk more alien and you've fallen into my trap so talk more <laughs> talk more finish that story uh go through the whole event from the moment you got into the room to the moment you yeah hold the whole event let's let's hear it okay. all. all right so you know i you know wanted to be in the room so i just was in the room and um it's like a bilocation i guess so to speak so I was in the room and um, I felt like I was floating and um, I looked around. I saw her walking by. She wore really high heels like this big and um, she was wearing a dress and, you know, work clothes. 
And I saw another uh, uh, co-worker sitting down. He had kind of weird hair and, um, you know, he just looked odd. Um, but as I was floating by, yeah, he turned his, his head and looked at me. And that threw me out of the scene because I was so surprised that he saw me. And then I thought to myself, oh, I should have asked for protections so that no one could see me. Because, you know, here's the... Describe, th- describe him. He was uh, looked like a white guy. He had uh, sort of weird spiky hair. And he had eyebrows that looked like Spock. <laughs> and he had a weird pointy face. And um, kind of like a po- really pointy chin. And, um, you know, I don't remember much about his nose. But anyway, he just looked angry and he turned and looked at me. So uh, you, th- you think he was alien? Do you have any idea? Um, I mean, oh, Spock on Star Trek, it looks almost totally human except for the ears. Yeah, and, the eyebrows. Uh, so this, what were all the characteristics of this person that did not look human? Um, I would just say his mouth was a, a strange, um, it, it, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, he just had a weird looking face. I mean, it wasn't. So, very- so your, your notion that he was alien came as much intuitive as, as, uh, phys- what he physically looked like. Or yeah, not- I, I think so. I just. I guess the fact that nobody else saw me, but he did, you know what I mean? He seemed male, and when he looked right at me, I just felt like I was seen. Maybe maybe that was it. So he just didn't, it was one of those things where you see someone and you're thinking to yourself, did I see what I just saw? I mean, you don't know. You don't know what you saw. So you, the, the biggest, besides the pointed chin and the eyebrows, even maybe maybe including those, the fact that he had a level of awareness where he could see you made you believe that he was more than just an average person. Yeah. That he was possibly an alien. Correct. Okay, so are there any other alien traps you can fall into at the moment? <laughs> I'm trying to think of some. Um, you know, I don't know because, um, um, I mean, I do... Okay, so if you can't think of an alien thing, let's go with, have you had anything happen to in your life that was um, like a paranormal event or a very, very odd event that maybe it's not alien and maybe you haven't already discussed it yet? All right, yeah. Um, When I was reading Incident at Devil's Den by Terry Lovelace, um, I saw a lot of ghosts uh, walking around in my house. And I regularly see ghost cats for some reason. <laughs> but yeah, so any so there are some sometimes certain books that bring out ghosts. So you think that reading about aliens caused you to think about or experience Jesus. ghosts? Yeah. That's an odd connection. Yeah. Uh, so um, why do you think you went from how do you, how do you, I know it was happened at the time you're reading his book, but I'm sure you didn't read his book in one or two days. You took I, did. I did. I did. No, book. I read his book in one day. <laughs> wow, that's nice or interesting. That means you have very high speed reading and, uh, and you were fascinated by his book at the same time. So uh, describe said ghosts of any kind. Um, one and guy, if you can, if you can, as you're describing them, take us to the moment of the actual ghost experience. Maybe one of them that was stands out in your mind. One of them was a woman. Uh, she was wearing like old-fashioned clothing and an apron that went around her neck and also around her waist. Um, she was walking around my house. Maybe that was her house before. I don't know. Um, and then uh, there was another guy that who was walking around. Hold on, hold on, hold on, stop. Go back. Go back to the lady with the apron. All right. Uh, um, 
was she solid, not solid? Solid. Uh, yep. Through partially, she was solid as in, like That's she looked one. like somebody who you wouldn't even know she was a ghost if she wasn't in your house. That's correct. Very solid. Yeah. Okay. And what was she doing? She was just walking around. She was walking toward me. Then she turned around and went another direction, and then she just disappeared. Did she disappear in front of you? Yes. Okay. And when she disappeared, how did she disappear? All at once or all top once. down? Or? All at once. All at once. And was it like like snap your fingers instantly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a blink okay. of an eye. <laughs> uh, the only ghost, well, not the only ghost. Uh, one ghost I saw uh, was walking past the lady's house down by the river near where I live now, and and I saw this figure on this porch, and I thought it was the lady herself that lives in the house herself, and but it it I couldn't see um, it wasn't. I couldn't get any, I couldn't focus on it. It's like it wouldn't go into focus. And as I was looking at it, it disappeared from the top down. It didn't do disappear all at once. It went literally the top of the head started disappearing and it went down to where the feet were gone. It top disappeared before the feet did and it went down really quick, disappeared very quick, but not all at once. And uh, that's the only full body apparition I've seen. And that was, uh, I think also two-dimensional, not three-dimensional as well. Uh, so you saw a ghost that was as solid as you and me. And had you seen her on the street, would you walk past her and not even know she was a ghost? Yeah. Yeah, I would. So was that that real? Yeah. Okay, well, getting that much detail, it's good because ghosts can appear in many different fashions and knowing how you experience them each of them is is good so go to the other per next person you were about to describe okay the next person was uh yeah this was interesting too it was a guy um he was wearing like a um like a purplish shirt and he was just walking back and forth um in front near my husband who was uh, sitting on the couch but yeah, i could not see his, his legs <laughs> so his legs weren't there, just his torso. And he was, you could see he was like marching back and forth. And the part of him you could see, how, was it two dimensional, three dimensional? It was uh, solid or not? Solid. solid. Yeah, it was solid. So it was just like the first lady, you just couldn't see the bottom of the foot. Right. <laughs> okay. And how many ghosts would you say you saw uh, at that time or overall in your life or whatever? Yeah, I've seen a few ghosts. I actually usually don't see them. I usually just hear them. So, um, but I've seen a lot of ghost cats. It's really weird. Um, I'll just start seeing ghost cats. Um, so do they look solid too? They're they're actually transparent to me. Oh, interesting. But, see uh, solid humans, but transparent yeah. cats. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make sense. But, no, it makes uh, sense. Yeah. What it, you know, paranormal is not supposed to make sense. It's, yeah. We don't understand it, so it, just because we can't wrap our mind around it doesn't mean that it's not logical. It just That's means true. we don't have enough information. That's so, true. So, uh, is there any context in which you see these ghost cats? You know, I haven't been able to figure it out because, um, you know, uh, you know, you have these patterns. So, like with the with me with the thing that happened when I was ten, and then also when I was sixteen. Um, you know, to me, they had no commonality. They were just two incidents that happened, you know? And so now uh, with the ghost cats, I do see them intermittently. I don't know what causes the, me to see them. I don't know what happens, you know, that the reason I see them. There's no pattern that I can see. So, you know, like you said, I can't wrap my head around why I see them at certain times and why I don't. So I don't know. Well, you know, we're trying to fit everything into patterns, and right. I'm sort of doing that, but I'm not trying to force things into pattern. If there's no pattern, that's that's fine. Right. So, um, you know, you can't fit the paranormal into a pattern. It's like aliens; they just show up when they want to show up. Right. So, right. Uh, anyway, 
what other interesting pieces of your life would you uh, prefer to divulge at this time? Okay, sure. Yeah, actually, this is in my book. And um, so I was married before and uh, my husband, uh, any, I was 28. And I started having night terrors. And um, but the only thing I would remember uh, was a black rectangle. And so um, but I would only wake up as soon as he walked into the room. So if I fell asleep before he did, he walked into the room, I would sit up and start screaming like bloody murder, like someone was killing me. And the only thing I could remember was a black rectangle. Now, well, I don't know. Stop, that is. Stop, stop. <laughs> OK, so the, the person you're afraid of looks like a triangle. Or what? No, rectangle. Rectangle. Not a triangle. I thought you said triangle. Yeah, everyone rectangle. does. <laughs> and my mind heard one thing and you said something else. Okay, so the rectangle, how does the rectangle and the person, how do you know this is a being or a person or whatever? How does the, put, put the two together, rectangle and person? I don't know. I mean, seriously, I was happily married. My husband would walk in and I would sit up screaming and I wouldn't remember anything except the black rectangle. Your husband would walk in the room? Mm-hmm, at okay. the time. How does the rectangle relate to your husband? It doesn't. Well, I mean, okay, so your husband walks in the room, you start screaming. Uh, give us the rectangle uh, connection. I don't know. That's a- well, were, were you seeing the rectangle in your mind? Was it in the room? Uh, Where is this rectangle in relation to you? I don't know. I don't well, know. How did, how did you even, Connect your husband walk in the room with a rectangle if there's because no it only room. happened when he when I fell asleep first and he walked into the bedroom. I would sit up and start screaming. You're you're sitting up in your dream? No. I I would not wake up, but I would sit up and scream bloody murder. While he, you're sleeping. While still I'm still asleep. I'm still asleep. My husband has got got not gone to bed when I went to bed. Okay, you're asleep in the I'm bed. In the bed. He's walking around. He walks. He in walks the into the room. You're asleep, but you but you sit up and start screaming. Yes. Why you're asleep? Right. Okay. Um, how deep uh, in a sleep were you at the time? Very right? deep sleep. Yeah. Okay, so how did you even know he was in the room? I you? did. He would wait since I was, I don't know, but okay. So I'm screaming. Okay. So you're, you're very deep. You're in a very deep sleep. He walks in the room. Somehow you have an awareness of his presence. You, you sit up and start screaming. Now, while you're screaming, are you still sleeping? Yes. Okay. So you're. Okay. All right. Uh, where does the rectangle come into the story? The rectangle comes in because my husband at the time says, wake up, wake up, you're screaming. And then I would try, he would say, what were you dreaming about? And I would say, I don't know. I remember a black rectangle. That's all I would remember. So the rectangle is in the dream. The rectangle is all I can remember from that dream for from whatever was happening there. Okay, so. I understand the the whole story, how the rectangle relates to your husband. Now, you're dreaming about a rectangle. He walks in the room, you sit up screaming while you're having this dream about a rectangle. Yes? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so I started, you know, looking into that using regression, looking into that situation. And the black rectangle equal means something to me, but I don't know what it is yet. Um, I've tried to regress myself to look at it. And all I can see are, dark, are colors orange and red. I haven't been able to see what's behind the black rectangle. So in your dream, the black rectangle is blocking something. It's, all right. it's, it's in front of you. It's hovering. Is it hovering? Is it, is it stationary? What is it in reference to you in the dream? It, all I, uh, all I, it's not moving at all it's just there like okay. a block so is it a rectangle bigger than a human um yeah that's a good question um it's pretty big i would say it's sort of like coffin size 
Okay, so it is bigger than a human. Since yeah. Humans fit into coffins. Right, right. <laughs> so it's bigger than a human. Uh, are you in it when you're in the dream, seeing the black, the rectangle? I assume it's a black rectangle. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, do you are you in a room when you see it, or what? In the dream. Um, let me think. Um, I'm just trying to. Yeah, I guess I'm in a room. I don't know if it's a door or if it's a coffin lid. I don't know. It is. I mean, I felt it before, and it feels like wood. So theoretically, it could be a wooden coffin. I don't know. Well, I'm not. I'm not really asking you to explain it. I'm trying to understand the context in the dream, as far as how the rectangle relates to you. How you relate to the rectangle in the dream. Okay. All right. I've stopped trying to connect your husband with the rectangle. Now I'm trying <laughs> to connect you with the rectangle because okay. you're experiencing the rectangle in your dream. So you have the connection. It's not your husband that has the connection. You have it. Right. So, uh, so is the rectangle vertical in a in a room? Um, it seemed like it was above me. Okay. And it's not moving, it's stationary. Yeah, it's stationary. And it's scary. Yeah. Okay. And have you ever woken up from this dream without your husband walking in the room? No. Okay. And so the fact that your husband walks in the room and wakes you up from this same dream, how many, how many, times have you had this dream of the rectangle relatively speaking ballpark um, i would say 20 times and have you ever speculated on your husband's connection to this dream or the rectangle well it's yeah, my ex-husband ex now but um okay. now ex-husband yeah where is your mind gone with the connection between the rectangle, uh, the scary rectangle dream, and your ex-husband, have you tried to fill in any of the pieces with your mind? And if so, how far did you get? I did have I did have Yvonne um, do a regression uh, of what anything that was happening during the time uh, that I was married to that guy, and um, a lot of times it seemed like we were both. Um, abducted, um, but that he wasn't always there when I caught, came back. So there is some connection, but I don't know what. Well, you realize you just fell into my trap again. You yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> back to the aliens. So please tell us about your abduction with your husband. Okay, so, um, you know, we lived in California, and um, we would both go to sleep, and then we would be awakened by the ETs, actually greys. Um, they would come and pick pick us up uh, at our bed. Um, what I remember seeing was two gray aliens holding both of my hands, and we were walking through the wall because it was kind of like a, um, what do you call it, like a sheet, like a transparent sheet. And we walked through it and got... Um, you know, then got picked up. I mean, that's all I remember. How did but, you picked up this memory through Yvonne's regressions? Yes. And uh, describe the aliens? The aliens are both two grays, uh, one on either side of me. Um, I mean, I feel like they were strong arming me, but anyway, they came to pick me up. Uh, they had um, their machine, they had me on a table, they had their machine over me, they were sucking out eggs out. Um, using some sort of machine that didn't go inside, but actually was hovered above that would suck, that looked like a um, a coffee can with two knobs. That's how I recall it. And they were sucking my eggs out. And um, that's what the reason they were there was to take my eggs. And um, then when I was taken back to my bed, my husband wasn't there. So he... I guess he was taken as well. So you don't know he was taken, but you assume because he wasn't there when you got back. All right, but he was there when I left. Oh, in the bed? Right. And how long were you back with him gone? I don't know. 
<laughs> did you, after you got back, he wasn't there. He wasn't did there. You, did you wake up and look for him or what happened? I think I looked around, but then, I mean, that's all I remember for the regression that I, I saw that he wasn't there. And then I just went back to sleep. All right. So now that you've opened up the uh, can of of uh, gray aliens. Yeah. Uh, we want more gray alien stories if you have them. Um, they're mostly, you know, of just of. I don't really I don't know that I have a lot of gray alien um, stories, but that is one from the regression. Um, it seems like I had a lot of jobs, you know, and so, but I don't know. I don't really know. I don't have any other great stories. That's probably the only one. So when Yvonne regressed you, did um, did you experience the regression as if you were reliving the event in, uh, as if you were actually there? In yeah. Every detail? Mm -hmm. That's what I figured, but I just wanted to, I had to ask because you, you never know. Uh, so is there any other knowledge that you picked up in your, since you've gone back to your regressions uh, here for a moment, let's stay there for a moment. And uh, do you have any other stories about aliens or anything else from your regressions, which is worthy of conversation with this, that you haven't already spoken about? Okay, yeah, it's just that apparently, um, you know, I've seen a lot of clones of me and, um, I think um, I have a lot of duties. I've had a lot of duties. You've had, so, you've had a lot of what? Duties, you know, so like my jobs are working with computers or uh, taking care of babies. It seems like about onboard stuff. Yeah. Can you go through any of those stories that you haven't already discussed? Uh, I think, um, yeah, I think there is one that um, I do think I do have one more. Okay, so they showed me a baby and they told me, what do you think of this baby? And I said, um, I'm not going to tell you because I know you'll use it against me. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just feel like uh, the greys are just using us for something, you know. So they showed you a baby uh, gray. Uh, it was part human, apparently. So it was a hybrid. gray baby. It was a hybrid. Yeah. OK. And that hybrid event where they showed you the baby, are there any other details of that event that are worthy of mentioning? Um, I don't think so. I think that, you know, I could see feel my contempt for the gray, you know, showing me the baby. I didn't want to play the game that they were playing, which is see this so, baby, this might be your baby kind of thing. So you were not in a good mood at the time? Um, I would say I was um, not that I wasn't in a good mood. It was that I knew, I knew their intentions. I knew that they weren't, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Genuine, you know? So they were showing me that baby. Either they were trying to imply something or they were, you know, trying to get my input and I wasn't having it. That's how I feel. So you didn't want to play the game. Right. <laughs> exactly. I did not want to play the game. You were not in a childlike mood at the time. You know, I, I think that um, maybe I know there's, there's the situation there, you know, as if. Uh, maybe I don't know what it is here, but when I'm there, I know exactly what's going on and I'm not willing to go along with it. So you entered that scene with a bad attitude. Yes, a very bad attitude. <laughs> you had a bad attitude. Yeah. So uh, any other uh, experiences that you uh, think are worthy of discussing? No, I mean, I don't know. I can't think of anything right now. Okay. Um, so we've gone over aliens, we've gone over being targeted, we've gone over ghosts, and um, I think that's everything we went over. Is there any other part of your life that um, you feel is worthy of, um, of hanging that laundry out in the public? <laughs> nope, I think I've done a good job, hopefully. 
uh, people don't think I'm nutty or uh, paranoid, but. You well, know. you've given enough details where people can believe you. That's you've done that much. The people who will believe you will believe you, and the people who won't won't. And it really doesn't matter that yeah. you convince the ones who won't because they are who they are, and the ones who believe you are who those people are who they are. Also, you can't you can't convince somebody who needs the alien to shake their hand to right get, to get it through them. You know. Uh. That's true. But, you know, it's unfortunate that we have to suffer so much ridicule as either a targeted individual or an alien abductee because there are so many people that have experiences and we can't all be wrong. And instead, they're just saying, well, that's not happening to me, so it must not be true. You know, well, it is true. Well, um, oh, that's <laughs> the were you an Art Bell fan? 20, I, didn't, ago. I didn't know him. I okay. mean, I, so he kind of moved the needle forward with the aliens when he started interviewing uh, multiple pilots from different airlines who were in, you know, miles apart and saw the same craft. And he interviewed police officers who, multiple police officers who chased crafts. And he kind of moved the the needle forward on believing that aliens are more than just illusion and uh, are people's uh, delusions or whatever you want to believe they are. He moved that needle forward. And then more recently, obviously, the congressional hearings have moved it forward in a few more notches. We haven't really gone that far. Uh, there's still most humans that don't believe, don't believe, and the people who do believe believe more uh, right we move forward but it, you know it's like we've taken 10 steps forward and two steps back or whatever it's not it's not like we've gotten in the car lambo lamborghini with the alien and drove off and had a good time yeah we haven't quite uh wrapped our minds around the truth yet so you've moved the needle forward a few more inches and we'll keep trying to move the needle forward with my show and and you will do the same with other shows and with your book. Uh, yeah. Show us your book one more time. Uh, move it backwards. And to the, yeah, that right there, Abducted and Furious. And the subtitle is? How I Fought Back and How You Can Too. Okay, now, here, from moving forward for the rest of this episode, you have full reign to promote, I could, Pull your bio up and read your website and all that stuff, but I'd rather you just give it verbally. Anything you want to give out, your phone number, just kidding. Uh, whatever <laughs> whatever details you want to give out to the public, uh, go for it. Promote right. yourself any way that you wish. Okay, well, my book's on Amazon. It's an ebook as well, um, and um, it's not very expensive. Also, uh, I have a uh, group on Facebook called Abducted and Furious with Lisa O'Hara. And so it's on Facebook um, and um, you can join that. I have a page as well, but the group is underneath. And uh, my um, website is lisaoharaonline.com. Lisa and do you have a, uh, a YouTube uh, page? No, I don't. Okay, and your Facebook group, um, the people meet or the people discuss things on Facebook but don't meet in any type of uh, visual fashion or, or is there more to it than that? Um, you know, I, I wish people would talk more on my page, but I feel like they want me to tell them what's going on, so I'm trying to do that. Um, my page is, uh, yeah, I have my page and then I have the group underneath because a lot of people won't admit or talk so much about themselves, right, on Facebook. Um, so I hope uh, if you if you want to join, my page is up there as Lisa O'Hara, I mean, uh, Abducted and Furious, Lisa, and sorry, Abducted and Furious uh, on Facebook, and you can just do a search. And then um, underneath it is a group and it's a private group. And so that's where we discuss more things that happen or that happened to me. Um, 
And um, but do you do you have um, my point? The question I'm asking is, do you have um, meetings, as in like Skype meetings or Zoom meetings or anything like that, or is it just conversing over Facebook? It's mostly it's conversing text. over fa Facebook. Um, uh, I don't know. I might. I, I don't know. I haven't. I don't have that much to say except for my own experiences. So I don't see myself uh, having a face uh, a YouTube uh, channel. But you know, I guess in the future that could happen. Well, I was just trying to dis decide whether your group on Facebook was uh, something where people got together on Zoom or Skype or some other fashion and discuss things live or whether you just texting back and forth over Facebook. Uh, yeah, we're just uh, talking b back and forth on Facebook. Um, but, you know, because, uh, yeah, I, I don't usually do anything live. Um, so without getting into anybody's, any particular person's story, is there anything you learned over Facebook about aliens that you didn't already know? Uh, I learned that the reptilian presence is a lot bigger than anyone ever thought. Uh, apparently, they're in our government. <laughs> um, so I learned that. I assume more than one person has mentioned this for you to come to that conclusion. Yes. Um, yes. Actually, it was interesting, too. So pr after I wrote, wrote my book and after it came out and I started going on podcasts, um, I didn't really know who it was who was um, doing this to me. Um, I mean, I knew that it was, you know, uh, you mean the targeting, uh, all of it. Yeah. Okay. Because I have a lot of negativity in my house. And so I started going to, uh, psychics and asking them what's going on in my house and nobody could tell me anything. So finally a, um, person I won't name said, Oh, you know what? You're actually dealing with the Dracos. Um, the Dracos are in your house and they're the ones that are bothering you and blah, 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 blah. Well, I didn't know that. And so um, sometimes and I would so, talk about them. So what was it about uh, what's happening to you that, that, that made them who told you that, the person who told you that, connect your, you to the Dracos as opposed to any other reptilians or any other aliens? You know, I don't know. They wouldn't tell me that. But they. But what happened was, I had posted about. Um, I had posted about you know being uh, harassed at my gym, and also uh, that. And then people were trying to say maybe you should just you know feel love, have love and light towards them. And I was like, it's not that way. You know, they are interfering in me finding out what's wrong with my, um, you know, stomach. You know. Uh, they're interfering in my life in ways that you can't even imagine. You know, they're coming to my house. Uh, so they somehow get into my house and they're stealing my cat food. They're stealing food of mine. They're stealing clothes. I mean, they're just. So what happened was uh, I posted on there and said, I'm not going to not talk about this because I think the reason that they don't want me to talk about this is because they want to keep everything close to the vest and keep everyone quiet so no information gets out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this. And so then this person said, oh, my gosh, we don't talk about them because it's dangerous. It's really dangerous. And so um, but before she came along, I didn't even know what and who I was dealing with. So, um, so that's how I even found out. I this is so. Recent. What you're saying is you have Facebook connections who um, are in a group about aliens who don't want to talk about aliens. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Because of the danger involved. Uh, okay. So. Um, is there anything else you want to say to the audience before we end our uh, our two-hour interlude of awesome knowledge about sucking your experiences out of your being and into the rest of the world? Um, I would say if you're in this experience, if you're having this experience, you're not alone. Talk to people. There are a lot of organizations that you can do that with. Um, there's opusnetwork.org. Um, it's a 
group of people with the experiences who talk to each other, I think on an email, digest. There's Ciro, which is um, look up Yvonne Smith. She runs a Ciro group. She'll regress you. She'll help you figure out what's going on. And then she will help you be with your people because, you know, it's isolating being in this situation. Um, you want to feel like you can be yourself. You know, you don't have to hide, you know, this information from all the other people and have a normal life uh, and then, you know, never talk about it. You can talk about it with what the people who actually understand you. So um, be safe and uh, take care of yourself and try to um, and also be in the normal life so you can feel grounded because otherwise, you know, you can just fall off a cliff with all of the different um, theories and narratives about what's going on. So, yeah. I, I interviewed the guy who runs uh, Opus, uh, if you want to listen to that. And uh, in any case, it was a pleasure having you on the show. I wish you the best of luck with your aliens and your uh stalkers and <laughs> that is what they are <laughs> more specifically your dracos and uh, yeah. i'd love to ask you more questions about dracos but my wife is calling me let me stop the recording and go grab see what she wants and i'll be right back okay